This is the Open Global Mind weekly call for Thursday, 4th of July, 2024. It is the anniversary of America's independence, which I like to refer to as Interdependence Day. Um, anniversary of America's Declaration of Independence. Independence took another, what, seven years to win. Arguably, we're still dependent on a bunch of things that we shouldn't be, but, you know, there could be the independence from oil day could be a day. Uh, there's a, a lot of interesting things we could play with here. Um, but thanks for pointing that out, Kill. Uh, we've been having an active conversation on the OGM Google group mailing list about the political mess, uh, particularly since uh, the Biden performed very poorly in the debate. I would love to go into that in this call. And if possible in a in a semi-structured way, in a way that somehow uh, gets us um, gets us thinking and talking about these topics um, um, in a in a not not a passionate, oh my God, we're all doomed unless you all do this right now way, but rather um, in a more controlled, more interesting way. And uh, Dave, just before the call, held up a diagram he drew in his notebook, which I'm going to screen share right now. It looks thus. Uh, so Dave, you, you basically said, Joe stays, Joe steps down. Uh, does it go to Harris? Does it go to someone else? Uh, and then <laughs> and it says, Matt for Jerry tomorrow. How about that? And then you had most certain, uh, least certain. So you think that it's most certain that Joe stays, uh, and then he might step down. Uh, in my brain, I started and I said, "Actually, Gary, uh, yeah, go ahead." It wasn't that it was most certain; it was the most certainty. If he if he stays, that we collectively have the most certainty. Hmm. Uh, Thank you. And if he steps down, it's kind of like decreasing levels of certainty. That was the idea there. Um, thank you. And I think that if, as we have this conversation, if people want to offer different measures for what success was, would look like, or, you know, what d different ways of evaluating the situation, that would be really helpful as well. Um, it turns out I did something, uh, Gil, I'll be right with you. Uh, I did something extremely similar. Uh, I, I, here's the, here's my thought on the first Biden Trump debate. I, I created one thought for today's call. Here's the node for today's calls. Uh, called Democrats Options After Biden's Debate Flop. And then I have Biden remains the Democratic uh, nominee. Can Biden beat Trump? Seems very unlikely. Biden steps aside and helps. And then I've had, uh, I've been cultivating a thought, Democrats who would make it great presidents now or soon, um, which includes people too young to be president like AOC, but has, a, a, I think there's a pretty deep Democratic bench. It's just that nobody knows who these people are. But I started this process and I'm going to elaborate on it during the call. Uh, as we go. Uh, Gil, please go ahead. Yeah, as I as I wrote last night, if this is what the call is going to be about, I'm going to leave in the next few minutes uh, because I don't think this is a good use of our time. Uh, um, I'm not interested in us, a bunch of smart people sitting around trying to predict the future four months out. Uh, I'm much more interested in us talking about what we're going to do about the future four months out. There's a lot of work to do in the next 124 days. Um, we don't have the knowledge or the agency or the prophetic ability to predict the future. And just as a data point on that, at this point in the campaign, what was it 1988? Was that when was that when Dukakis was running against Poppy Bush? Could be. <clears throat> uh, Dukakis was 17 points up in the polls four months out. So anything we say about who's going to win or what the Democrats should do is frankly, to my mind, bullshit. I'm not interested. Uh, I am interested in what we can do to get out the vote, what we can do to win elections, both the presidency, whoever it is, uh, and every other election up and down the ballot, especially in critical swing states, um, not just Congress, um, <clears throat> but also state legislatures where um, the rules for elections are set and run. Um, so that matters for the future. Um, there are a bunch of organizations that have strategically targeted uh, get out the vote campaigns, phone calls, letter writing, postcard writing, canvassing, and so forth uh, that people could be hooking up for. Um, um, yeah, so uh, that's my piece. 
Um, thanks, Gil. And a, a couple of thoughts. I think I, I also would love for us on this call to talk about um, uh, what to do about our personal networks, you know, the, our, our personal contacts, how to join the ground game the way Kevin was talking about on the mailing list and what mm -hmm. you just said, uh, and maybe also where to put donations. Uh, oath, uh, Oath.org, I think it is. I'll, I'll look it up. Is, is a site that tries to actually move donations to the place where they'll make the most good in the electoral cycle. Um, and they're they're dynamic. They're they're constantly sort of shifting where they uh, put uh, you know where they send donations and stuff like that. And there's a bunch of others. Um, Gil, I think. I and, think and our... there's, there's 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 a bunch of those things, and that's an example I think of where OGM and its people could be very effective to you know to keep moving that information out in our networks. There's a lot of resignation out there. There's I mean I'm seeing people who are saying oh it's all over. Well, it's like you know it's four months out. It's not over till it's over. And there's work to do, and we have a, ne a network that can be activated in that. That strikes me as a lot more useful than trying to predict, um, you know, through, through Dave's tree diagram and others that I've seen like that, because who the fuck knows what's going to happen? Um, so, Gil, yeah. I agree with you, although I think we have usually pretty interesting collective intelligence. And I think also... Um, I don't think that we're sort of each crystal ball gazers trying to say, oh, this is going to happen, that is going to happen. I think that our observations about the dynamics of the moment are, in fact, useful. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that conversation, yeah. at least to me, is is very generative when I when I hit it. Uh, yeah. in, in, you know, in particular, hey, it's not too late. Lots of things could happen. It used to be people got nominated at the convention. We haven't even gotten to the convention yet, blah, 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 blah. There's all kinds of interesting things there. But... Um, my concern, for example, is um, who who is the democratic ticket? Because I think that who gets chosen makes a great deal of difference, and there's a lot of observations about that. Um, but we'll we'll get into that. Um, and I appreciate your perspective of not wanting to waste time. Uh, anyone else, John? Uh, yeah, I <laughs> I definitely get the you know do do important things to get out the vote. I mean, my sister is taking a leave of absence from her job and moving back to Michigan where we grew up. Wow. Because that's a battleground state. Now she happens to be a very strong advocate for Gretchen Whitmore, but it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, it's like whatever. Um, the thing about the conversation about what's going to happen to me, the value, like with all scenarios, it's, it's less predict. We always had to keep, when we were doing scenario planning, keep trying to downplay prediction. And of course the clients would keep pushing, no, 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 we want the prediction. But our thought was, it's the thought process. It's the having thought about the thing that isn't gonna happen, but that has fertile juice buzzing in the in the environment. And that juice might, you know, then the question becomes, well, can you get that juice without the specific outcome that you were, you know, or the specific strategy that you were, enamored of before you began the process so i mean that was always an uphill battle <laughs> we we fought that battle over and over again with our clients but eventually some of them got it they said oh okay it's not the prediction it's the preparation for alternate ways of thinking okay and they bought that um thanks john and as people are already doing if you want to share your best resources for the moment in the chat, please do. I will share the chat back as we always do. Um, also, had the Biden campaign been doing thinking like John just said, um, they they might have thought to have Biden actually proactively um, say, hey, guess what? I'm not the candidate. I'm stepping aside. And then the Democrats would have had the advantage. Uh, as of this moment, the Democrats are completely wrong-footed. And one of the things I'm really interested in is them not staying wrong-footed through the election. Um, I'm a fan of the OODA loop. And I wrote an essay back in the Bush versus Kerry campaign. If you remember Kerry, swift boating, flip-flopping, all that kind of stuff. Um, let me just let me just put this in the conversation quickly. Um, OODA means observe, orient, decide, act. It was invented by John Boyd, a uh, Air Force colonel who was kind of a, a, a manic guy. He would call his subordinates at 2 a.m. and uh, get them to uh, you know, start some idea or do, some, do whatever. But observe, orient, decide, act is meant for dogfights where um, I'm in a saber, this person's in a MiG-19, uh, we're over uh, North, Korea, uh, North Vietnam, uh, sorry, it was Korean War. So we're over uh, North Korea and um, 
this so observe is the just this the moment orient is that's a, a that their fighter can out climb out turn and out gun me but i can out dive and out something else them decide is that means i'd better do this real quick and act as pull the joystick move the the elevators do the whole you know do what you need to do um in the bush carry electoral cycle i noticed that the, the the right always had new ammo and they were basically dropping things in and carry had no idea how to respond uh he he was a twice he was a decorated war hero who came back and then did the heroic thing of going to congress and standing up in front of congress to say the vietnam war was wrong and still he he, he lost against a guy who was a draft dodger with bone spurs uh no that bone spurs are trump sorry gosh this seems to go around a lot uh, anyway I say all this because Kerry didn't know how to reply in that moment, and the far right was armed with a terrific method of keeping the left off balance, which they did totally. And I see that happening today. Um, so I'm trying to figure out how do we find our way to a candidate who understands the dynamics of the moment and uh, what might that do? Uh, Pete, thanks for putting the OODA loop in the chat. Um, having added that to the conversation, I will open the floor for whatever people want to, which direction people want to go in. Any direction at all? Yeah, I'll go. Please, stay So, <laughs> um, Professor Lichtman, who has his 13 keys, he actually was the one that predicted that Trump would win. He's very clear that using the data and those keys, which have predicted all the other elections, that Biden is our best chance. That being said, the fact that we're even having a conversation of who should be the candidate when we have a candidate is really disturbing to me. That we start off with, we had a bad debate, and so what are we going to do when, I mean, if we're talking, I mean, first of all, I think we need a conversation about age and cognitive decline, because we're not talking about the cognitive decline that we've seen in Trump, which is far more dangerous. I have watched him repeatedly, and it's not just slurring words or not being able to finish his sentences. It's talking for minutes at a time about Nikki Haley, but thinking he's talking about Nancy Pelosi. He, it's about not knowing where he is. I mean, I haven't heard, I mean, I, I've been hearing days and days about Biden when the very, I mean, look, when the debate started, the first thing I noticed is his voice was low. I was disturbed. That mic could have been turned up. I noticed there were lots of times where the angles looked like he was disoriented. And as soon as the camera changed, I was like, oh, that's not so bad. Now, I respect all of you so much, and I could never debate, I would never even think to debate any of you. However, I will be bold enough to say that if I were allowed to lie and not be fact-checked, I'd take any one of you on. <laughs> so I don't think you understand, or people, well, no, people do understand, because we've been doing it for eight years, what it's like to try to debate with someone who is barraging you with lie after lie after lie. So maybe he couldn't get the words out. He knows where he is. He knows what he's doing. He has good judgment. But aside from all this, that's not even the question. It's not up to us. And it really, when I saw him the next day in North Carolina, and I saw the crowds around him, chanting and i don't care that he was talking off a teleprompter because he knew where the teleprompter was i would rather be talking about this danger of trump and frankly i think that we have to focus more on his cognitive decline because that is really 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 scary biden has good people around him i i just think we need to change the whole conversation i i you know i'm sorry if i'm so yeah, I just want to say one more thing. When I was a mother, there were a few times where my kids needed stitches or got hurt. And I had to stay calm because if I was calm, they were calm. And I think, you know, uh, Doc Searles put in the um, in the chat, he mentioned a good idea for laying out the candidate's actual platform because we haven't heard one question answered by Trump. But he also added that 
it needed to be Biden himself. And I want to just push back a little bit on that because how other people think is very important to people. Maybe most of us like to make our own decisions, but 99% of people look around them and they think about what, what is everybody around me thinking? And we get swept up in what everybody around us is thinking. So please, re I mean, this is the candidate. This is the candidate that has the best chance, whether we like it or not. So what do we do to help it happen? Because we're facing a really, really big threat. And I need we need to talk about Trump. <laughs> now I'm done. Thank you. Stacey, thanks for saying what you said. Um, I am uncertain that this is the candidate. So I'm trying to avoid um, us taking that stance in this call, although I'm happy you know, to hear us each individually say that's where we stand. But I'm, I'm wholly unconvinced that this is the right candidate, in part because Biden showed up for a debate and Trump showed up for an M MMA match, for a cage match. And that should have been easily predicted. And Biden was defenseless. And I mean defenseless in front of a gish gallop and in front of Trump, predictably, running, trampling him, just trampling him. And and my problem is not, my problem is not that he might, might have slowed down a little bit with age. All that stuff is great. My problem is that he doesn't recognize the battle being fought and that people who are following Trump totally see that. And they're like, wow, you are so right. He doesn't get what's happening. The Trump, Trump committing crimes, getting, you know, scot-free from all of them, all, that is part of the strategy. That, that's like part of the desk. First, there was a desperate attempt to claw back the election that failed, luckily, but they're running on this weirdly. And so they're not running a logical campaign. The Republican Party hasn't had a platform the last two electoral cycles. Their platform is whatever he says. The, 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 the Republican Party has not published a platform. It's just freaky weird. Um, Gil, go ahead. You're muted. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, I'm keeping myself muted too not have my grunts uh, take over the camera. Okay, good. Thanks. So, so look, uh, uh, Stacey, you're not a bad debater at all. So thank you for, for that particular rant. A um, couple of things here. Um, um, we, we are doing lots of thinking cycles and speculation cycles off of extremely limited information. Uh, we saw the debate. We don't see what he is doing day by day. We don't see him in the White House. People in the White House, according to the reports we're getting, report both that he is aging uh, and that he is just like seriously sharp and on the ball uh, in detailed conversations. We don't know. We don't know what the balance of that is. We don't know, we don't know what the trend of it is. We're reacting to the debate that we saw where, yeah, his performance was not sufficient. The Democrat, It's not just him. The Democrats have a long history of bringing knives to gunfights. It goes back a long way. Um, and it's not just recently, but it's been clear to me for a long time that part of Trump's strategy is to do things that render the opposition apoplectic. We sputter in disbelief. Like, do you see what he just said? You know, and that's a, it's actually an immobilizing strategy. It distracts us from the work. We just sit around thinking, you know, like sputtering about how crazy and bad they are. So there's that. Um, on the platform, Trump has actually in the last couple of weeks been talking about about trimming down the Republican platform making it less complicated, having less stuff online and supporting exactly what you're saying, Jerry. But on the other hand, and finally, blessedly in the news cycle this week is the Heritage Foundation Project 2025 report, which is a 900 page, extremely detailed game plan of what these guys plan to do should they get power in November. And if you haven't read it or read reports about it, please take a look. It is chilling. It's a roadmap for authoritarianism and for rolling back everything that all of us have been working on for the past 50 years. Uh, it's a bait and switch. Trump talks generalities, heritage is laying plans. Uh, and it looks like maybe increasingly the conversation from the, uh, from, the, from the democratic forces will focus more and more on that. Um, um, Jerry, to your point about the candidate, um, we don't know who will be the candidate, but we do know who is the candidate. And until somebody else is the candidate, Trump, uh, Biden, Harris is the ticket. It may change, but we don't know if it will change, when it will change, or if it should change. Because if you read the smart people about this stuff, the smart people are all over the map. 
about the strategic significance of who the choices are. I don't pretend to know that. And even if I had enough knowledge to have a, a grounded opinion, it would still be a guess in the face of political uncertainty. So the reality is, this is the candidate now. This is the platform now. This is the opponent now. How do we work on that now to move that well? And if the OODA loop throws a different candidate at us after the Stephanopoulos interview tomorrow or the next week or the next month, well, we pivot and adapt when that happens. Uh, but the, what the OODA loop tells me is you don't put all your stuff into one of the alternative strategies until the orientation has shifted. So end of rant. Thanks, Gil. Um, around big issues like, hey, is AI going to kill us or save us? There's all these big issues out there. The smart people are all, often always all over the map on, on big issues, um, but several of them actually are seeing clearly. And had we listened to the couple who saw the, pro the who framed the problem well, we might have acted really, really differently instead of saying, gosh, opinions are, are different. So I'm, I'm concerned that some some of the people yelling, do this, do this, do this, are actually probably right. And we won't know for 20 years, um, but but they're out there. They're actually saying like really super smart things right now. Some of the super smartest people that I follow have come to different conclusions about what Biden should do. Right. It's really interesting to see. I mean, like, you know, uh, you know um, Ezra Klein, extremely cogent argument for him stepping down. Uh, Charles Blow, extremely cogent argument for him not. And, you know, and there's there's many on the list and we could add them up or tally the votes or weigh them. I don't fucking know. I confess I have I have I have lots of reactions to what I saw. I don't know what the right thing to do is. But cogent arguments can be analyzed and taken apart and compared. And I like that a lot, uh, though, you know, we should we should sort of be we should be taking those essays and contrasting them to each other. Um, I'm, I'm more interested in seeing how he does tomorrow with Stephanopoulos. Unscripted, no teleprompter, under pressure. <laughs> So and Biden, Biden is okay, uh, even or, with a even with a friendly press person, yeah. where he where he's melting is where on the on the stage where it matters. So the, the problem is if Biden faces dramatic opposition, somebody really intent on going after him, he's you, naked. You don't know that. You saw one event. Oh yeah, the other thing I wanted to say about the camera angles, um, this I, I forget who I read about this, but you know. What we saw is not necessarily what we saw. Him looking distracted and off to the side, he was looking at the moderators. The podiums were not positioned symmetrically. One of the mistakes the Dems made is they didn't put him at the left-hand podium. They let him be at the right-hand podium. And he's a guy who likes to look at people. He was looking at moderators when it appeared he was looking off to the left and down. That was decided by a flip. It was, oh, it was decided by a flip of the coin, says yes, Jane. But the, but the physical setup was destructive for that purpose. Um, the 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 look of vacancy and mouth hanging open. Um, we interpret what that means, but if you've known people who are elderly, people who have incipient Parkinson's and other things, the facial expression is not necessarily a reflection of the internal state. It sure as hell looks like it on television. It they looked awful to me. But that. and they've denied he has Parkinson's. I don't know. My mom had Parkinson's. I'm familiar with the Parkinson's mask uh, and what's hidden behind the facial expressions or lack thereof. So I would encourage us to be very careful about drawing conclusions from very limited evidence that is many layer filtered before it gets to us. That's all. Um, thanks, Gil. Uh, slow then Dan, please. Uh, Dan, I'd love for you to talk about what you just wrote in the chat, but first slow. Um, yeah, I... I'm, I'm dubious that this conversation is is worth our much of our time uh, and 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 agree with the sense that it's it there's a lot of concern and panic based on ideas about how people will respond without waiting to see how they are responding. Um, the polling that I've seen so far comes out to about a 1%, 2% a dip at most. Uh, if that's how it stays, uh, to me, it's a float as far as the electability you know, or whatever goes. Uh, if it continues to dip further, you know, then, then it's of a concern about electability, but we don't know yet. So uh, for me, the, the primary focus 
you know, like I, I looked at some emails in the mailing list. Somebody suggested working, Amer you know, focus for democracy, focus for something which pointed to working America was the only group they supported, the AFL-CIO, uh, uh, you know, association for people not in a union. And I signed up there. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to. It, uh, I'm a freaking anarchist, but I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna go and like support get out the vote efforts and so on uh, because I am against autocracy, <laughs> and that's what we're facing. So I mean, it's really very straightforward, and to me, it really in the in the big picture, it does not matter whether we have Biden or someone else, and all of the energy put into deciding about it, for especially for people who are not you know in much of a position to influence. It, I, 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 I think there are other things we could be doing that would be more worth our time. Um, yeah, so I, I appreciate I appreciate hearing bits that are about, you know, his actual competency. But honestly, you know, especially as the election goes on, like it, I, I, I'm not sure how much it matters. Like it, it, we will again. We'll see in the numbers. That's to me. That's more important than what people are writing about in editorials and whatnot. Uh, the the numbers. Sorry, the numbers both in the polling and Congress people. I mean, that's where we're seeing it happen, right? One 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 sitting Democrat has came out yesterday. Raul Grijalva came out. Like, if that becomes a flood, then you know the 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 power most powerful people in the party are pushing for it and we should make it happen one way or the other the main thing is to not have it drag out you know forever um yeah uh, check um thanks john Th there's an argument also that the numbers if by if by which you mean polls are really screwed up now and that polling is is itself a mess and that we shouldn't pay so much attention to polls and that the horse race journalism is really bad for us and all that and i agree with most of that Although I do think some kind of sample uh, is really interesting. I will add that I have a relatively new, m much more conservative friend than me who hates MAGA, uh, but says, hey, if if the American population, the American public regularly polls 60 to 70 percent in agreement on important issues like should a woman have a right, uh, a right to choose and a few other things, the Democrats should be running the table. The fact that this is a 50-50 election means something is broken with the Democrats. And he means congenitally broken, like really off. And I'm listening and I'm like, wow, that unfortunately makes some sense. The, the other argument is that Citizens United means that pouring money into campaigns makes everything show up 50-50. It's a little bit like in World War I, uh, once everybody sent the orders to militarize, to, to sort of get everybody out to the, to the battlefield, Everybody had plans that unlocked and, and loaded everybody up to bring them to the front to the front at the same mo moment. And there was this gigantic collision around a front that didn't move for four years, hardly moved at all. But but once the orders had been triggered, everything was was set to go. Um, so anyway, uh, Dan, do you mind saying I, a little bit about? I I just want to point out that the yeah. uh, that thing where oh, if most Americans you know most Americans agree on this or that or so on. That's not new. That's been true for a very long time, that there are a lot of issues like that. And the vote is, has been very close. So there's yes. nothing new that happened. Uh, uh, government and politics are inherently conservative and they lean that way. So, that, you know, whatever the issues are, uh, uh, it, it, it thinks the reality of what the government does tends to lean more conservative than the people. It's been my the way I've seen it all my life. Uh, and observations like that are the things I'd love to hear um, in this conversation because I'm I'm like mm, I'm, I don't know that's not that's a new thought for me. Um, let's go Dan for a sec and then uh, Doug C. All right, um, yeah, a lot of lot of interesting conversation here, a lot of a lot of thoughts that I have, but the one that kind of sticks up for me most is are we uh, are we utilizing a tactical or a strategic mindset? Um, and from from the way I see it, barring some sort of major development, which we have not yet seen, uh, the substance of the election is already, you know, the electoral narrative is already laid down. Um, and mostly this is about spin and narrative control and, and things like that. You might disagree with that, but that's just in terms of like where we are at right now, that's what it seems like to me. Um, the The biggest question in my mind is, how do we improve uh, the, the the discourse 
um, not just on the DNC side, but just in general, um, how do we how do we improve our uh, our sort of um, uh, mindset on the left in terms of in, it, like from my point of view, the, the the notion that we should all align and be rigidly attached to one candidate is counterproductive. It it may be it may be momentarily productive in the general election, but uh, but it is counterproductive every other time. And it it sort of quashes the, the diversity of ideas and um, reduces voter engagement. And that's, I think, this the substance of uh, of a, a healthy democracy is how do we maintain a decorous alignment while still having a healthy debate about the, the issues of substance? And if we normalize that, um, then I, I think it it makes us less inclined to say, well, Screw you, my candidate, you know, my preferred candidate didn't win, so therefore I'm not going to vote. It, it fosters engagement. Um, so lots of other lots of other thoughts about, you know, how voting systems affect the long term trend and how our epistemic health affects decision making and engagement and attention span. But uh, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Daniel. Um, Doug C. Yeah, I'm really impressed by how there was a kind of rush to judgment about Biden's performance. If you read the transcript, Biden seems to be more coherent across more issues than Trump. And he doesn't seem to get credit for that. It's like people are responding to some fantasy of uh, Asian disaster uh, that might not be pertaining. End of, end of thought. Um, thanks, Doug. I, I'm going to go back to if you're looking at this as a debate, I totally agree. Like, Biden was lucid. His sentences made sense. He was trying to bring facts into the whole conversation. But it wasn't the debate from my my perspective. Uh, if you look at Nixon Kennedy, Nixon was sweating on, on TV. This was TV was new. The lights were hot. Um, Nixon looked shifty and uncomfortable. He lost on popularity, not on content. He lost on how he looked on TV, and, and Kennedy was this young, vibrant candidate, that famous example of, of what happened. So, so the substance of the conversation is, check, I'm with you, no problem. And I, I, I think Biden runs a mean administration. He's doing a fine job of passing more legislation than anybody has in a long time. And yet, the dude I would like, the, the dude or dudette I would like at the head of this country um, needs to be able to fight the fight I'm describing, needs to be able to not only survive in the cage match, but turn the cage match into a petting zoo and into the kind of discourse Daniel is, is, is uh, telling us about. That we need to somehow find a person who can tame, uh, tame the monster and get the monster to actually engage. And a thing I just typed in the chat is, I think a part of the problem is our modes of discourse. This debate was, you have two minutes to do this, one minute to rebut, one minute to this one. No, 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 no. We need some format where people with opposing points of view can sit down and say, well, I think this because I believe this because this has happened because this is over here. And the other person can say, yeah, but if you look at it this other way, this happened and this happened and this is why we're doing all of this. And then they could have discourse. But we've got this this adversarial setup that goes no place that I that I think really hurts the the country. Pete, thanks all. Um, I I totally get the uh, I, I get the tactical need to do to do something to um, maybe stave off autocracy, for, for instance. Um, at the same time, I'm. I have a hard time concentrating on this presidential race because it it doesn't seem like the important thing. Um, the, the important thing to me seems like how did we get into a situation where this is the choice uh, between something that's pretty infallible or something that's like, you know, objectively terrible. It's like, <laughs> come on society, you know, if this is the best that we can do in governing ourselves, to have this choice and to have this choice make so much of a difference, apparently, you know, it's like, so <clears throat> did the system get gamed and an autocrat is this far away, you know, a couple heartbeats away from, from being the dictator. 
isn't that the problem? The problem is that the system is broken in such a way that, you know, and, and then it's like, and this, this whole debate isn't even talking about what the Supreme Court is doing, right? So I feel like the way that we uh, have arranged our federal decision-making system, um, you know, has been overrun uh, by, uh, you know, by, by other things. Uh, so it's kind of like having, you know, um, massive stage three cancer and we're worried about, you know, uh, whether or not the arm is broken or something like that. It's like, <laughs> come on, folks, there's a bigger like death happening. Um, and it's not, you know, whether Biden can can, you know, appropriately meet Mr. Trump or with whether Mr. Trump is crazy or not or why people, why there's a whole half of the political machine supporting somebody like Mr. Trump. It's like just insane to even be like, we're in the wrong thing if we're talking about, you know, which, uh, which horrible decision to make um, and which, you know, whether or not it's actually important. Um, thanks. Um, thanks, Pete. And you're getting to a part of the reason why I held those four calls about what works in governance is like like I was trying to work my way toward, hey, what would a functional system look like where we didn't end up in, in situations like this? I didn't phrase it like that at all, but you just rang that bell really loud. Thank you for and, that. And if I may, I, I, uh, the, I think the counter is on the ground movement uh, towards sustainability. Um, uh, so our, our friend Kevin, you know, when he's just making a difference in a watershed, that seems a lot more practical, um, and uh, you know, it's it's it it looks small. It's not the presidential you know election, and it's not the federal government. But I think if enough people are doing the things uh, in smaller places to make it right, um, instead of to continue to prop up this uh, antiquated, uh, dilapidated, um, clearly sociopathic system at this point, you know work work locally and make a difference and continue to grow that effort instead of you know uh instead of being uh led by, around the nose by this antiquated you know and with with uh, with full understanding that it still matters you know um that the the cancerous dinosaur is stomping around you have to watch out for it but that's not the place to you know deciding to shoot the the dinosaur or deciding to uh put the tourniquet on the dinosaur on, on the right side or the left side. It's like the dinosaur is, you know, a bigger problem than, uh, you know, whether which side to pick. Um, I like that analogy, Pete. Um, Bill. Actually, Jane. Do a coffee for Jane. <laughs> Please, Jane. Hi. Hi, hi there. Um, While it may matter how we got to where we are, we are here, and that means this is the fierce urgency of now. And I recall that it was Black voters, especially women Black voters, that made the difference for Biden's turnaround in his campaigning. And it's Black women who are going to win this race in battleground states and elsewhere, and the strength of Biden, as perceived by black, woman, black women, probably has a lot more to do with, with Kamala Harris than it does with aging Biden. And Amy Klobuchar came to Biden and asked him to choose a black female running mate way back when. And he had the wisdom and the savvy to do that because he understands something about the emotional force of female aspiration in this country. And we have a Supreme Court justice Thomas, whose pride and his, <coughs> his degree of emotional damage from his upbringing and his 
sense of pride has made him so vulnerable to the dark forces seeking to corrupt our government that he's essentially there's a great misogynist drama playing out here mm -hmm. and the control of women has been central to emotional manipulation in pol in the political game and that manipulation has become so complete that it's now possible to start threatening actual violent control of the population through this death squad ruling of the supreme court So it seems to me the emotional savvy that the Democrats haven't had is there in its female population. And we need that savvy now, and we need to figure out how to empower that savvy and how to be empowered by it. We need their empowerment of us. We need them desperately. And that's why I signed up to work for Working America, because they're the voters that they have the most impact on are black voters. I think even more specifically, female black voters. So it's really a primal revolution that's at play. Deep, deep in the human psyche. Thanks, Jane. Thank you very much. Um, let's pause for a second um, with what Jane just said. We've been going quickly through everything. We can enjoy Mike sitting at a baseball game, apparently. Um, wow. New York Yankees? You're at a Yankees game? That's a Mets fan. Oh, damn. You're right. It shows, shows you what a sports fan from New York I am. Um, yeah, let's pause for just a second, then we can go back in. <laughs> Bashanals Park. I love it. Um, John, the floor is yours. Um, I uh, just completely agree with Jane. It struck me that uh, paying special attention to, you know, where black women are moving or not in the polls is probably of particular, you know, relevance. Um, and uh, I, I have the most hope when we do not pit action in the moment with a, a dinosaur in front of us against long-term work you know, to to address the system in general. I think both are very important and I think they need to be looked at and considered together. If we try to focus on only one or only the other, uh, I think we're likely to make terrible decisions. Um, for me, it's a little easier maybe than some of you because for me, the system has not slid into dysfunction in some recent dynamic. Uh, it's been in deep dysfunction my entire life from my perspective. The need for a profoundly like to me we have it at our best we've had a, 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 a kind of a middling part, part way there less than halfway there democracy the way i understand democracy um and and the fact that it wasn't as good as uh, nearly as good a democracy as it could have been is what allowed it you know to slide from when the middle class was doing better in the mid but only some of the middle class you know <laughs> were doing better in in mid century uh uh but it, it it and and i've been shocked by the degree to which patriarchy you know it, like when i was younger i thought wow we're really making progress this it's moving and it's like and and I mean racism to a degree too. And then and then uh, uh, I there was an article ah, I'm forgetting his name. What a prominent uh, black you know political commentator uh, talked about Trump as the first white president. And what he meant by that was that in, in uh, after Obama, 
there's this kind of, uh, oh, we, we, we need to, we need like now a white man who was like terrible morals, like uh, clearly kind of not very understanding, even clued in a bunch of things like they can win. So like now for black people to have equity at the representational level, we'll have to wait till a black person that incompetent becomes president for, for the country to kind of be equal again, in, in, in a sense. Uh, and that that made sense to me. Like that reaction was so strong, like it put together why Trump, you know, harassed Obama for years and then why that message resonated so much with a sector of the country and then why he was able to turn that into a win. Um, so to me, like when I come back to the election from that, to me, that's a massive silver lining to if we do end up changing candidates it you know there's a lot to recommend having a woman having a black woman uh who can as much as possible you know stand up uh, to trump the way jerry was describing that has probably more power than many of us are thinking um and i hope the people in the biden campaign you know are very aware of that and you know obviously they can bring other people to campaign you know even if Biden is uh, the candidate and they should lean into that. If they can find ways to put strong women next to Trump, you know, that's very hard, you know, but it, it, that's one thing that I, I don't know how to make that stuff more visible in a way that gets to people. Roe v. Wade certainly helps. Uh, so I, yeah, I feel like there's a lot of things. Yeah. Anyway, that's enough. Check. Thanks, Slo. Um, the Honorable Representative Dress from New Jersey. New York. Oh, sorry, New York. <laughs> That's okay. Um, yeah, what, J what Jane said really moved me, and it, but it also tapped into something and made me connect something that I hadn't really put words to, which was <laughs> part of what was really affecting me, and I've noticed a lot or among a lot of the women that I've been talking to, it was almost this anger that the guy had a bad debate and you're turning your back on him. And that is a very real feeling that I know I tapped into and I've experienced, and which is why I know that, but let me just stop there. I just wanna say one thing. I don't know of one person who changed their vote because of debate. And I'd be interested in knowing if any one of you have changed your vote. Because to me, this, this is really a vote, a vote about enthusiasm. And again, I don't think anybody's changed their vote. And I think that keeping this, the fact that this has become the discussion publicly instead of what it would have been otherwise, most people don't even watch the debate. We do, but most people are living their lives. And like when you, when you talked about Nixon, that was a whole different time. I mean, I was too young. I wasn't watching it, but, but that was a whole different time. People are not paying attention. What they're paying attention to is the, the chatter they hear around them. That's what people pay attention to for right now because we are far out. So I just, I just want to say that, I mean, I saw what happened between the Bernie and Hillary factions and I just hate seeing Democrats just turn on themselves and somehow we just keep going in that direction because to our credit, we do have different opinions. You know, I really liked the idea that after the debate, I didn't hear any Democrats saying, oh, it was great, which is what you would have heard if the roles had been reversed. So I appreciate that. But the one thing that I like better about the other side is there is some sort of loyalty and teamwork and we're all in this together. And I don't think that's an emotional component that we should ignore. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Um, let me say a couple of things before passing it to Judy. And then Gil is asking if we can shift to a, a more pragmatic uh, tone in the conversation. I'll see if we want to go there. Um, a couple of things. The debate overshadowed um, several other really significant events last week, in particular, a couple of uh, SCOTUS decisions that were miserable and have a chance to really reshape how government works and how the executive works. 
Um, if Trump is is in fact elected, his his ability to do things with impunity, because he now would now have uh, immunity for um, official acts, and he could pretty much call anything an official act. So it's really uh, that was really fascinating to me. Um, then, uh, if you'll remember, at, at the same at this time in the 2016 electoral cycle. Um, I think uh, Donald Trump had the Access Hollywood tape and he was about to pay some money to a porn star to keep her from a second story erupting. Like there was all kinds of shit hitting fan, uh, you know, really close to the election in the electoral cycle. So we should kind of get used to the roller coaster ride. These are the things that happen. And, and notice that Access Hollywood and all those things did not dump him off the campaign. A thing I will marvel at forever is that Howard Dean yells yells at his troops in a slightly hoarse voice, and he's off the campaign trail a week later. Um, and Donald Trump does ten things on any one day that are worse than than the worst thing Obama did in eight years of presidency, and is still the candidate. It's astonishing to me. Now, and, why? Why is that, Jerry? Why? Um, you... Because he has normalized the misbehavior, and because everybody's all in. I and and Gil, I think opening up and unpacking the dynamics of that is more important than figuring out which place to donate. I think I think better understanding the dynamics of how Trump can get away with everything and still be strong is hugely important because it lies at the crux of the matter. Um, and, I, and I don't think it's because there's that many idiots and racists who are all backing Trump. I think there's a bunch of strategic thinkers who are backing Trump for a lot of different reasons we're not appreciating or thinking about. And we do so at our great peril. Uh, really, at our great peril. And so the last thing I said in the chat is, um, I'm I'm worried that the country is turning into The Handmaid's Tale and a couple other you know dystopian sci-fi visions. And I'm surprised that every woman in America, especially women of reproductive age, isn't up and in arms and that men aren't helping them say, hey, this could be a one-issue election and I'd be fine with that. I'd be absolutely fine with that because the the, the, the dialing back of reproductive rights is going to happen. Um, I, I I don't see a reason it's not going to even as even as Trump is backing off of the harshest version of that because he knows it's bad for his politics. And adding to the mystery is why white women broke for Trump in the last two elections, which is just utterly baffling. So yeah, those are really important questions. Uh, and if we don't win this election, a lot of that discussion becomes pretty moot. Yeah. Um, well, it's it's the, it's the Handmaid's Tale meets the Hunger Games. This is really this. It's Trump is good for the media business, but Trump understands modern power better than any other politician in the sphere. Uh, I'll, I'll, let me go to Judy because Judy's been patient. Media. Democrats have club feet regarding media. Absolutely, uh, Judy, you need to find the unmute button. There you go. Yeah, I'm. <clears throat> excuse me. I think. There's a different way to frame this that we might want to consider very strongly because women have been the stability of the country in many ways for centuries, not just recently. The issue of women's rights was a more recent event and the impact of that on some of the electoral issues. But if we could engage a larger, larger percentage of the women exerting their influence wherever they have their influence and lending support to the need for us to have a generatively positive approach to sustaining the quality of life of large numbers of people and maintaining some intellectual perspective and intellectual freedom, that would help. The problem is we're in a media frenzy where less than 5% of the people have a high capacity to learn by reading. And so they're affected by what they see on the radio and what their friends are doing who are also influenced by media frenzy. And we're not allowing people to sort of be grounded or to focus on the grounding of what's important for the survival of their family and other people. And I'm concerned that that polarization is very dangerous because of the impact it's having. And in particularly when SCOTUS is doing such a terrible job and has been so loaded with Republicans from the appointments that Trump made so I think it's a big problem, but if we could mobilize women in a, an engaged way to influence the people that they already know how to influence, it would go a long way in changing the direction of the election. I don't know how we would frame that platform exactly. <clears throat> I'm not a political strategist at all, 
But it really bothers me that so many people are essentially disengaged from the process and not thinking individually, just sort of following along with what they perceive to be a trend that can be influenced by the media. Thanks, Judy. Um, Kevin Jones. Uh, there we go. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, you know, Gil posted on the list a, a book by somebody who said, you know, I wanted to find out what I could do. And it turns out there's really lots of things I could do. And there's several books like that, like, hey, here are all the things you could do. <clears throat> I'd be willing to work with some group to put it on Massive Wiki to say, here are all the 25 book uh, things and, and what are they saying that are in common and, and then, you know, some level of, you would get smarter about that if, if you just could put two or three solution books together. And I think it'd be an interesting, you know, collective intelligence wiki project. Sounds excellent. Um, easy to do. Uh, let's use the OGM list or uh, that that's the most yeah. the easiest thing at hand. Let's, I'll, I'll send out an email to say, if you want to be part of that, uh, email me off list. Sounds great, Kevin. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Awesome. Stuart. Yeah. Um, a number of uh, somewhat disjointed thoughts. I think that Gill's remarks at the beginning saying we don't know <laughs> were, was a great frame for this conversation. We really, we really don't. But I, I, I want to say a few things, you know, listening to what's come up. Um, and, and two, I think are the most important. One, um, I will never forget the impact of Donald Trump being interviewed by uh, Barbara Walters way back when. And as I watched that interview, um, I, I just remember so clearly saying to myself, this guy is just making the shit up, okay? And that phenomenon, I don't think, has changed. Um, one of the gravest mistakes that have gone on in terms of the journalistic community is, is trying to legitimize him as a president and analyzing his thoughts and his actions as if he was a rational actor. And he is not. He is a totally irrational actor. The other thing that I think is important to recommend or to, to realize is that, and we've had some thoughts about this. Um, debate. Um, we live in a binary world of win-lose. Um, it's a piece of cultural phenomenon. I think in part it's it's reflective of the focus on sports that we that we kind of live in. Um, and this notion of, of, of binary win and lose and um, you know bringing a, a knife to a gunfight, I don't I don't think is um, is important. Um, except for what gets conveyed in the media. Biden showed up with his stutter and a little bit of feeb some level of feebleness. And I think that raises a legitimate question about his capacity to govern um, going forward. Evidence, um, he's run a really good administration. Um, he's got good people around him. But the idea of analyzing that in terms of capacity going forward, I think is important. Um, a number of people have talked about the antiquated system we live in. And I think that's just such an important piece. There's resistance to change um, because people resist change, one, and two, because people want to hold on to power. Um, and as a result of that, what is a system that's 250 years old is a still a governing piece and we are such a different universe than we were in 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 1776 um the conversation that jane raised about uh, black women um i think um as we move further into the meta crisis um and we will because the climate is going to get worse and nobody's paying attention to it um that a lot of wisdom will come from black women and black churches in terms of perseverance 
which I think is an important word to think about as things that we can't imagine right now um, start to come down. Um, I want to um, just read um, a quote, a message of hope that my late wife sent out as part of her Christmas message in 2005 when we were still reeling a little bit about the election of George Bush, which seems <laughs> such a, 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 a tiny, tiny um, a, a thing to, to gripe about at this moment in time. Um, a message of hope, a little patience and we shall see the reign of witches pass over, their spells dissolve and the people recovering their true sight um, restore their government to its true principles. It is true that in the meantime, we're suffering deeply in spirit and incurring the horrors of a war and long oppressions of enormous public debt. If the game runs sometimes against us at home, we must have patience till luck turns. And then we shall have an opportunity of winning back the principles we have lost, for this is a game where principles are at stake. Thomas Jefferson, 1798, after the passage of the Sedition Act. Thank you. Would you put that in the chat for us, please, Stuart? Uh, if you have a copy paste, or is it, is it out of one of those paper book things? Ah, paper note, even worse, man. Okay. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, Doug B. I, I don't think there's anything new. Um, in this moment. And um, Trump is following a playbook that was very, very successful in Germany, <laughs> literally chapter and verse. And the forces that are funding and behind him uh, are vested interests and profiteers and power holders. And, and um, I resonate really loudly with Jane's share. And I don't think there's nearly as much chaos and as many choices available. Um, if Kamala Harris is not the replacement for Biden, then um, there's no black vote. And if there's no black vote, there's no democratic victory. Like that's literally tautologically fact. So the white woman and two white men that are the lead, you know, potential governor, you know, replacements for Biden are not because they're white. And it would be a violent breach of the last vestige of um, democratic relationship with the black community if Kamala Harris does not step into that breach. I believe that's that's fundamental. That is one of the big dangers afoot. Sorry, Doug, go ahead. I, I believe that's fundamental. And in, in one of the pollings recently, she was the only one of the four of them that actually was head to head with Trump in a, in a direct run, in a direct uh, campaign. So, but more deeply than that, um, this is really about um, the, the desperate need in the ascendancy of the divine feminine. Not the gender politic, but the divine feminine. The values of caring, the values of nurturance, the values of um, being in service to. And the reason 50% of the population was susceptible to a Trump and the reason right-wing fascism is on the rise around the world is because of the number of people that are in fear, that are dispossessed or marginalized, are threatened and are in desperate straits and um, are drawn to somebody who says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. 
And I, and I don't think it's more complicated than that. Um, and well, I'll leave it at that. I'm complete. Thanks, Doug. I will just note that we're talking a lot about Black women without having any of such people in this call. I am personally very curious how we might learn authentically what Black women are thinking right now and how to be helpful to them. Anybody who has any ways of learning that and doing something about it, uh, of the many things that might be done in this at this part of the cycle, that is one of the things I'd be interested in trying to do. Um, um, uh, off to you, Gil. Yeah. <clears throat> um, as for participation of Black women, how many of us have close friends who are Black women? Yeah, not many. I've got a couple, not close. I don't see them often. Um, um, you know, people are going to come to this group through affiliation and relationship. Um, absent that, one of the things we can do is we can listen to Black women and what Black female organizations are saying and take some leadership from there. But I want to come back to what Doug B. just said. And with respect, Doug, um, it, uh, you said this is literally such and such true. It's not literally, it's figuratively, it's speculatively. It's not true because there are no facts about the future. It's a cogent interpretation, and I agree with a lot of what you said. Uh, but I want to be very careful about us asserting future truth because uh, it's a trap I hear around me all the time. And there's no truth about the future. And I'll say again what I said earlier in the call in case folks weren't, in case folks weren't here. At this point in the Dukakis-Bush campaign, Dukakis was up 17 points four months out ahead of the election. It was not predictive because there's a lot of stuff that can happen uh, in between. Um, I'm sorry Ken isn't here this morning. He and I hosted a um, Living Between Worlds call a um, couple of weeks ago uh, talking about how minds change. And the speculation was there are five critical factors, not a complete list, but five things we focused on. Uh, fear and logic, which is where we focus a lot. Um, um, blanking on my list. Um, but what well, your list in my brain? Yeah, if you could pull it up, because I'm remember forgetting what all what the what 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 three and four were. But number five was about was desire, uh, or attraction, or the notion of a future that calls us forward. Or to put it in very simple terms, organizing around the world we want, not just about what we don't like, not just about what we want to suppress or flee from or transform, but where we want to be and pulling us toward a future that we want, and speaking to that aspiration where. To, to the comments that some people made before, there's an enormous amount of congruence in the American body politic around fundamental values, sense of fairness, uh, um, issues. If you don't call them by the branded names, people affiliate around. Um, and I would argue that that has a lot more power than logic uh, in the game that we're playing. It's not, it's not facts that convince people to change their minds. It's something that calls their hearts and calls their sense of affiliation and meaning. Um, and the Democrats at their best have one with that. Uh, but they don't always play that. I put your, I put your things in the chat, Gil. Thank the drivers you. of change. Oh, thank you, let's see, there you go. Yeah. Representative Kaminsky of California. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I, two, two quick things. Uh, I. I, I actually do have an anecdote about a, a friend who happens to be black and female and living in Texas. Uh, she's a tech professional. Um, uh, we've been talking every week, you know, about AI actually. Uh, so one week uh, we talked and, and she was excited and a bit distracted from our, our usual, our usual uh, topics. She said, Pete, I'm moving. <laughs> um, I, it's it's funny. She and I connect on the tech stuff, and usually, you know, we're just two geeks talking about tech stuff. But she has realities in her life because of the color of the skin and because of her her sex that are just realities that you know I I don't have to deal with. 
So literally, she's like, you know, the first coming of Trump uh, made the people around me in Texas, uh, you know, the, my peers at work, my neighbors, it gave them some license to give me shit just because of the color of my skin. Um, the second coming, if it happens, I, I can't be here. It's too dangerous. I'm picking up everything and I'm moving to another state. And, you know, it, it, it's visceral in a way as like for me and, and afterwards, you know, on every dog walk, <laughs> I'm thinking, shit, she, uh, she's like taking action. I really, she's, she's smart and thoughtful, you know, and she's like, it's, it's time to get out of Dodge. And I'm like, is there stuff that I should be doing? And I keep going over and over in my mind. It's like, yeah, you know, for a guy like me, it's, it's going to be different if an autocrat is in office, but it's not going to be different in a way that threatens my, my life and existence day to day every, you know, so not only does she have uh, a decision to make about who to vote for, um, she literally has, is, is not safe in her home <laughs> um, and has to get out of the state. Um, so uh, the, I, a completely different thing, the, the other part of this dinosaur that, that I really, I, you know, so I'm not, I'm not a great sports ball fan. I know the various sports balls. I know the rules pretty well. I know, you know, like some trivia about different things and, and I can kind of talk about sports ball. If, if it gets deep, like which cap is which, I don't know, you know, like which game is the big game this weekend? I don't know. I, f I feel like that with politics because I, I feel like I don't understand politics at all because the, the Dems, whatever, you know, there's the, I, I think there's two teams, there's the Dem side and the Republican side. All the Democrats had to do was be prepared for this guy Trump coming up, right? And it, it seems like an own goal to me, uh, like a, an unforced error to get to this part in the election campaign and say, oh, we've got this guy Biden. He's like, you know, maybe he's going to be terrible. Maybe he's going to win. Maybe we don't actually know. It's like, where the hell was y'all's succession planning? You know, this, you've had like three years to prep, you know, for Kamala to be the person for, you know, whatever. Biden should be like stepping aside gracefully, uh, artfully, like, you know, the Dems should go, Biden has been awesome. You know, we love him. And look, we have a whole new like powerhouse to, to meet this Trump guy. Instead, the Dems are scurrying around like, <laughs> like rats leaving a ship or something like that. What the hell? You know, what, where's your strategy? Where's any thought, you know? And it's not like, I mean, it's blindingly obvious to me, which maybe is why it's not blindingly obvious to somebody in power or, or the only read I can have on it is, the Democrat, the Democrat system is not a power structure. It's just a bunch of folks uh, like like flailing around on the field. It's it's like looking at a football field, and there's a bunch of six year olds uh, up against a pro team. And it's like, <laughs> how did we get here? Who let the six year olds uh, be the pro team? I don't know. So another thing that that makes me crazy. I like that we're sharing the things that make us crazy. Feels very healthy, like an expunging of, of emotion here. It's good. <clears throat> Representative Jones of North Carolina. You're muted. There you go. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I put a link into the wiki of books about how to save uh, the democracy. I've got the first one. Kevin, that, Kevin you your know, audio is breaking up on us. There. And I'll be looking for others, and you can... Well, you know, I'm, I'm on the phone. Okay, let me turn off my video. That's better. Uh, go know, for it. I'm on the phone and we can see broadband from here. Uh, we're about to have to go to Starlink anyway. Uh, but anyway, um, I put the first entry in the wiki of uh, these books that tell you 25 things to do that you can save democracy. And if people want to be part of it, you can email me and I'll put them up or I'll be glad to give you a password to my wiki. But you know, there, there's a bunch of these books and what can you learn from, from looking at several of them together with a group? I would love to be part of some group. And, and this can move to massive wiki in a heartbeat. Pete, if you, somebody else wanted to put it into something more open, I've just gotten like two or three entries uh, just to get started. Because I'm, I'm really interested in if there's stuff you can do and, and all these people have figured out all these processes well, why are there so many of them? Can, can you make it simpler? And, and can, you, can you point to the things that, that have 
catalytic impact, you know, I don't know, it'd be neat to, to call from the, the, the books of solutions. So that, that's a project I'd love to be on with people. And I don't have to lead it, but I put some energy into it. it. Sounds great, Kevin. Thank you. And by the way, killing your video really helped your audio. Um, kill. Yeah. Please. Can't wait till you get Starlink or something like reliable and solve it for you. Yeah. Go ahead, Gil. I hope once you get it, Kevin, that Musk lets you keep it once he finds out what you're doing with it. Um, um, uh, to, to Pete's point about the Democrats flailing, um, that's the narrative. Um, the reality is that Biden beat Trump. Uh, Biden has had one of the most remarkable legislative accomplishment records of any president in modern history. Uh, that's not, and, and in the face of Republican majority in the House has actually gotten shit done. That's not flailing. Uh, so I hear what you're saying, and it's not the whole story. Um, I think the Democrats have a really fundamental political challenge. Democrats are a very broad coalition, many different groups from many different perspectives, and it's a very multi-issue coalition, lots of things that we are concerned about, even us here, uh, and certainly a Democratic coalition. The Republicans have had a very tight focus on a very few issues for a very long time. Uh, what we're seeing now, you know, the, the, the coup of the last couple of years is a playing out of a 50-year strategy. It goes back to the Powell Memorandum in the early 1970s. Uh, and you can chart the story. There's a film called The Heist, The Stealing of the American Dream, uh, made by my friend Donnie Goldmacher. I encourage you to take a look at that. But basically, the game plan has been on the table for 50 years. And they have been working with great focus and discipline to produce that. They also have a lot more money, but that's not it's not only the money, it's how the money is focused. They've also built a farm team. Um, uh, with a great deal of rigor. They've put a lot of emphasis on local elections, taking control of local school boards, city councils, and so forth, and doing issues local and building up a team that could play effectively at national level. Um, and they've cheated, uh, notably Mitch McConnell blocking Merrick Garland's nomination, uh, which would have given us an utterly different Supreme Court, uh, an utterly different last 10 years. Uh, so it's, it's, Flailing is an easy story, and I've got plenty that I'm dissatisfied with the Democratic Party about, have been for a long time. I mean, my friend Ernie Lowe tried to bring the, the California Dem Democratic Party into the Internet age in the 1990s, uh, and they just couldn't hear it at that point. So there's lots of issues with them, um, and we're up against a very focused and consolidated adversary here uh, that's doing a good job with their game plan. Um, somebody mentioned Bannon. I don't know if you saw Bannon's interview with um, it was Jonathan Carl from NBC had a sit down interview with him, which was a, one of the weirdest things I've ever seen. The reporter and interviewee yelling at each other uh, for extended periods of time. But Bannon is very, very clear on what he's up to. Um, Jonathan I, Carl was I, terrible yeah. in that interview. Terrible. Yeah. Well, it was a very difficult interview to do. I don't know who would have done better. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, Bannon's happy to go to prison. He's happy to lead a revolution from prison. It's been done before. He sees himself in that mold of, you know, Goebbels or Trotsky or name your name your character. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's a very challenging. Problem. Gil, what would you say all of that activity is in service of? Power political and economic power. Uh, the, the, look, the anti-regulatory strategy, which again goes back to Powell. Powell was commissioned by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce to develop a political strategy. I think it was 1974. And it was a manifesto for the elimination of regulation, which is to say that any constraints on the ability of capital to maximize capital, safety, justice, labor rights, environmental quality, in, that's in the way. Get it out of the way. That's the core of it. Get everything out of the way of con my, my spin on it, of the concentration accumulation of capital for the sake of what? For the sake of concentration and accumulation of capital. Political power in the service of capital, which, by the way, is pretty much the classic de textbook definition of fascism. Um, Pete, then me. And then we're getting close to the end of our call time. Um. Thanks, Gil. To clarify my dis dissatisfaction with the Democrats, um, the, the flailing for me is uh, as succession planning. Um, it, it's not a secret that there's an election coming up. Um, uh, Trump is a known quantity or should be at this, at this point in time. 
um, we should not be four months away from the election. And it's like, oh my God, we think our guy might win um, or maybe not, or uh, he's gonna stumble on a, on a debate. I just know it. It's, it, it's inexcusable and, and to me a bellwether of their ability to be a strategic force to say, to, to leave it to the end of the game and say, well, you know, we, <laughs> we forgot to do succession planning. Succession planning is not, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's a millennia long kind of like thing that you do. And they, to my eye, they have completely, utterly failed at it. Um, and leaving us, leaving us to have this kind of fricking discussion, you know, oh my God, our, my, our guy might lose. <laughs> Where were we like two years ago when it actually mattered what we could do? Oh my God, thanks. Um, what Pete said, if I could just run that on repeat. Repeat, oh my God, I've never thought of that. <laughs> um, two things, two different things that I wanna put in the conversation. One is, if you talk to Mika Sifri, he will tell you the story of the original digital campaign that <clears throat> at the first Obama election that they ran, which was brilliant and excellent and created an app and a database that was really deep and they started to build connections and relationships and then Obama wins and then the Obama administration abandons all of it, leaves it by the side of the road. All these activists who are turned on and like, oh my God, this is going to be so cool. They create like a digital force inside the Obama administration, which is separate and different. And some people jump in there to try to help. But, but the entire ground game, the brilliant ground game they ran to win when Obama had very little time in Congress and still becomes president of the United States, they just abandoned it. And that's one of the many sins committed along the long path that Pete was just pointing to. Um, th there's just so many things that Democrats have done poorly. So here, here I'm going to like, I want to say something that's hard for me to say, um, but my more conservative than me friend uh, says it all the time. And I'm like, God damn it. And basically he says the Democrats are all about special interests. And, and he means basically um, uh, minority groups like LGBT, black women, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And they've been taken over by concern for a bunch of different fractured constituencies that don't represent the heart of the country. And they've started ignoring the meat and potatoes issues that actually affect the heart of the country and everybody else. And he points to the Democratic platform. You can go look at the Democratic platform at the DNC uh, website. And if you read through it, there are a couple issues in there that are about economics, maybe a couple. It reads like it was taken over by somebody who read too much CRT or something like that. It absolutely, it absolutely doesn't represent the country. And, and like a country that's trying to face difficult decisions and make its way economically and figure out inflation and who knows what. Um, so I, I, I report this as his perspective because I find that um, un, trying to understand and be a good ally for uh, underrepresented and oppressed people is a fabulous mission for humans. Uh, in particular, people who don't fit that demographic, that, that, that being a great ally is a really high calling. And yet, he says the reason the country is off following Trump is that the Democrats are busy, completely distracted, uh, and, and have been eaten over by a bunch of policy questions that the far right has just blown oxygen on and turned into bonfires. Trans bathrooms. No, seriously, the number of humans affected is really tiny. It's not a big issue unless you pour like oxyacetylene torch oxygen on it. And then it turns into this flaming pile of stinking goo that you can carry around and light people on fire with, and that's what they've done, right? And so there's, there's a series of issues like this where the right can say, hey, look, the left is busy doing this crazy ass thing, and it, it's a tiny thing. It's just a wee little thing. If you look at the platform, there's a couple of things on it. You're like, seriously, that's a big issue? Guess what? You pour enough fuel on a tiny issue and it becomes a big issue. You make a big issue about it, you raise a stink, et cetera. Uh, in the hanging Chad's decision way back when, there was the, uh, what did they call it? The polo revolution or the polo shirt revolution? It had a name um, because a bunch of basically crisis actors went in and protested uh, the counting of the Chad's and that protest triggered a fast Supreme Court decision that made Bush the winner. Right, because oh, we don't want to. We don't want to take too long. We don't want to fall into that. That was acted out. That there were a couple of famous uh, far right activists who were actually in that crowd wearing polo shirts or something. That that's the name of the of the act. I'll I'll look it up. But 
we're 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 in that kind of world and we're not in a in a debate society we have screwed up debate we have screwed up discourse um we have broken our ability to actually have empathy for one another and sit down and talk and solve problems together we've built a whole series of edifices that don't trust people um and we take them for granted and so i'm i'm concerned that the whole system is really broken um, and a lot of people are voting for Trump because they think the system is broken and they want him to shatter the system. And people like Steve Bannon want to be the architects of the next system. That's Bannon's calling in life. And the fact that he does some jail time just makes him a martyr to his cause. Um, Hitler did some jail time for the putsch. That's where he wrote Mein Kampf. Um, the current president of Brazil was put in jail by his political opponents. Lula da Silva. Um, you know, jail time doesn't guarantee pretty much anything. Um, and I'm trying to figure out how do we keep this country from being run by a criminal enterprise and turning into the handmaid's tale, which is not a great note for the end of this call. So I'm going to pass to Kevin and I'm going to see if anybody else has like a, a story about kittens, puppies and baby dolphins that maybe we could end with. Uh, so if you'll please, please think about that. But uh, Kevin, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. There we are. Um, so uh, I read something the other day that really made sense of why the Democrats are a Democrat as a party are systemically dysfunctional. It's because there they are, there is no Democratic base. There is but it's a coalition of you know Southern Black, Northeastern, self styled progressive whatever, and Midwestern Union. And, and so you have to appeal to all those within that structure and so that you can't get stuff done. So the things that have been good have been around and, and beyond the party making new things. So that's where I'm looking when I'm looking at these books to see what new groups are doing something. So I think the party is not built to work. You know, it's built to be a coalition that is, you know, barely functional. So that, that's all. Totally agree. Uh, Stuart, um, Stuart, yeah. then Eve, then Gil. Yeah, you asked for something sweet, a kitten story. Watch a movie. It's a National Geographic movie called Billy and Molly. Billy and Molly. Um, it's on the Disney Channel, I think, or Hulu or one of those places. But it's 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 the sweetest one hour you will spend and, um, it's an otter love story. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. That, that's the perfect balm. It's it's this it's a story about a man about an otter who had lost its mother and attaches itself to Billy, who had been a miserable, uh, uh, in a miserable way for many many years, and it's how this otter love story and how they connect and bond, and uh, it's it. Just watch it, okay? It's beautiful uh, scenes, I think, from uh, <clears throat> uh, northern Scotland, uh, and and it's just a just a very very sweet story. Um, Stuart, thanks for that. I will confess that I'm a, a total sap <clears throat> for like short videos from the dodo on YouTube, which are always like, <laughs> "Oh, look, these animals made friends, and here's a rescue doc, and oh, yeah, it, they're great." They're awesome. Um, good. I feel my heart lightening as we speak. Um, Eve, please. Well, first of all, I want to just thank you, Jerry, for bringing all of us together. It's just a wonderful space to be in. So I just wanted to, you know, uh, when you're feeling kind of distraught, this is a great group to be part of. And then I, do, I also want to say that um, really great conversation today. I mean, really, thank you all for all your comments and all your links in here that I've got. <laughs> um, so thank you. Um, but just to add that um, I do feel like we're living in 1933. <laughs> it, it really just like the, the parallels are insane. Um, so I'm just going to party like it's 1999 and, uh, you know, champagne and caviar. I know I'm not trying to be flippant, but if you want to just, you know, we need to do actions. We need to do hard work. We need to do all the things and we need to enjoy life. We really need to enjoy life. Thank you. Um, Gil, you may be having the last word here. I may be. Thank you, uh, Eve. Yeah, we, we should party and do the work. You know? And the, the 1930s parallel has been has felt very alive for me for the last several years, uh, both in the in the mood, the sense of the gathering storm, 
um, um, seeing an autocrat be elected in a legitimate election and use the laws of his country to eliminate the laws of his country, uh, chillingly too parallel. Um, so there's work to do on that. Uh, yeah, joyful along the way. Um, um, one of the things that is a tradition in our household, which we will do today, is that we'll read the Declaration of Independence in its entirety out loud. Uh, it's a magnificent piece of writing by Tom and the other guys. Um, it's also a really important kind of writing because it's a it's a declaration, a particular kind of speech act that creates a world by the act of speaking. Something is brought into being in the act of speaking. And remember, these guys, you know, pledge their lives, their trust, and their sacred honor. Uh, and if you look at the history books of what happened to the signers, these folks paid heavy price for that commitment. Most of them paid a very heavy price for it. Um, but they did it, and it transformed the world. And for all the imperfections of this, what, 248-year-old experiment, it's pretty remarkable. And it's on this chopping block right now. And... Um, I know we're over, so I'll just say one more thing to the question. You know, a number of people have talked about the the really difficult nature of the Democratic coalition, Democratic Party coalition, and the breadth and sloppiness of it. And Jerry, you know, tendency to be pulled this way and that way on different issues. The great Bernice Reagan, who was the founder of uh, the a cappella group Sweet Honey in the Rock, uh, a member of the Freedom Singers and the Civil Rights Movement. Um, um, major executive at the Smithsonian Institute and just like brilliant musician and singer uh, and political organizer um, said at a conference I think it was back in the 1980s she said if you're in a coalition referring to a political social change coalition if you're in a coalition and you're not deeply uncomfortable all the time your coalition's not broad enough and I think that's a good note for us to wrap on thank you um, there's a poem I recommend reading uh, that's a little long, so I'm not going to read it uh, into the call here, but it's lovely. That's, um, I think, as important as the Declaration on this day. Langston Hughes, Let America Be America Again. Yep. Um, with that, I thank you from the bottom of my pithy little heart for a great conversation. Uh, <clears throat> I learned a lot. Got a lot of things to follow up on. I, for one, love this conversation and didn't think it was a waste of our time and et cetera, et cetera. So i um, happy to have um, been through this. Thank you all. Thank you all. See you in a week and have a happy fourth Interdependence Day. <laughs>